Well, good morning and happy Easter. My name is Andrew. Um, today, I have with me my good friend, Miss Amanda Baldwin. Good How are morning. you? Good morning. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. I'm so glad to be How here. How is your Easter going so far? My Easter is going so, so well. I just heard that a fourth grader gave his life to the Lord in our large group. Let's go. Kids. So That's I'm awesome. I'm loving it right now. That's it's so, so cool. good. And yeah. had that conversation with a volunteer, which is and really And had cool. the conversation with a volunteer yeah, with so his cool. parents. Yeah, so not, thank the you Lord for serving. Yeah. Thank you, family ministry, so for all cool. you're doing. Well, hey, if you're joining us today, and we have been in the middle of a series on the book of Revelation for the past couple, well, since January. January, yeah. One. It's so been a minute. <laughs> for the, this whole year so far and the rest of the year. But uh, it, I mean, I'm hearing so much feedback from so what good, people yeah. are learning, how yeah. people are growing, what God is doing in people's lives. So I want to encourage you to share the stream right now with yeah. somebody. Somebody may be coming to mind. So whether you're in the worship center or you're watching from home, all you have to do is scan that QR code and text that link to a friend. Who Again, whoever God is bringing to mind. If you're watching on Facebook right now, simply hit the share button. But I'm excited to hear the stories of what God does yeah. when we are intentional to share with people. Absolutely. And if you are here in person, watching online, joining us in the chapel, and it's your first time, we are so glad that you are here. And we would love to know that you are here. And you can let us know one of two ways. You can pull out your phone, scan the QR code that is on the screen, or you can text the word NEW to 98173. And we would just love to know, who are you? Where are you from? What's your story? What brought you to Long Hollow? If you're here on campus, I would love to invite you to check out our information area. There are people there, smiling faces. They even have a gift for you. Just want to hear your story and what it is that you're doing here. Right, yeah. So check out the info area. We also have New Here kiosk at all, all of the entrances. So yeah. even if you didn't stop on the way in, be sure to stop on the way out. We'd we'll love to meet you. Love to get you that gift. And also just love to hear what God is doing in your life. Yeah. Okay, so Amanda, Easter yes. weekend is one of those times of a year yeah. where we know we have a lot of new people coming There's for the lot. first time yeah. or watching for the first time. And one of the first questions I would ask is, hey, what does this church believe? What do they believe about the Bible? What do they believe about Jesus? What, do they, what is their mission? What do they have it for my family? Yeah. All these type things would come up. Well, I want to point you very easily to where you can find that. All you have to do is scan that QR code or simply go to longhollow.com slash beliefs and you can read all of that right there. And of yes. course, any of us would love to have a conversation with you yes. about that at any time. Okay, being Easter weekend. Be Easter weekend. What are some fun things our families have to do here oh, on man. campus? Long Hollow Easter is so, so special. We bring in lots of fun things. So you may have seen as you walked in, we have live animals outside. That's I was right. just petting a chick <laughs> not too long ago before we started. Uh, super cute. So we're walking around with chicks and bunnies literally in baskets, but yep. we also have lambs and goats and a donkey and a cow. Oh, we, yeah. It's a whole farm. <laughs> like it's a, here a today. It's a miniature cow. It's a, like it's a, a mini cow. Yeah, mini it's not a big cow. cow. It's spotted. It's adorable. So we all have the, all those for your family to check out. We also have lots of photo booths scattered around campus, both inside and outside. There's a line like behind us that we were right before we started. So make sure you guys step in line, get a picture with your nice little Easter's best on your little dresses, your little suits. And uh, yeah, we've, so we've got you covered. What's really funny is yesterday, my family, we came and we worshiped yes. together on Saturday. And Everybody's all dressed up and they look yeah. nice on Easter. Right, and one head. of my kids forgot his shoes. Like, <laughs> that, like that is just the story of our life. And, and they weren't even dressed up. They were in like fine, Nike know? sweatpants and a t-shirt. Come as you are, you know. Whatever. So yeah, you. whether you're in your Easter best or wearing what you wore to bed last night, we're just thankful. We're glad you're here. You're here. <laughs> Be sure to grab a picture and have a good time with your family. Okay, so this is a big week weekend. Of, yes. Obviously, it's Easter, but Absolutely. I want to be intentional to invite you back next weekend as we share Pastor Robbie's testimony. Okay, so what a testimony is, is your life before Jesus, how you met Jesus, and what Jesus is doing in your life now. Uh, and Pastor has an incredible story of redemption and how God rescued him out of a drug and alcohol addiction yeah. and what God is doing in his life now. So, good. so you may know somebody who would be encouraged by that story. Uh, that story may inspire some hope in Jesus in their life. So I want to encourage you to join us next weekend. What's cool is we have our three Sunday services and then we are adding an additional Sunday night service. Sunday night. So if you, are, you join so us good. next Sunday and you're like, hey, I know a friend that would really be encouraged by this. We have that opportunity for you to bring him back, bring him back. next Sunday night. You can text story to 98173 and find all the times there. Well, hey, uh, here in a moment, we're going to have the opportunity to worship together. What a I'm service so, it's been. It's I'm so, so good. excited. It's been an incredible weekend. Last one, best so one. so glad you're here. So we're going <laughs> to worship together. We're going to hear a message out of God's word, okay. and we're praying God does something huge in your life today. So again, thank you for joining us at Long Hollow, and happy Easter. Happy Easter.
Hey there, welcome to Easter at Long Hollow. Who's excited to be here? Okay, okay, let's try that again. Who's excited to be here? Okay, cool. Well, we're so glad that you're here today. Okay, now let's have some fun. Let's try something simple to start. On three, let's do one single clap in unison. Ready? Here we go. One, two, three, clap. Nice. Let's try that one more time. One, two, three, clap. One, two, three, clap. One, two, three, clap. One, two, three, clap. clap. Now, take out your phone. Yeah, it's okay to have your phone out in church. Now, everybody turn your camera on. Now, take a picture with the people you're sitting around. Great job. Now, everybody get your flashlight ready on your phone. Some of you just realized that your flashlight has been on this whole time. Let's try this. When I count to three, I'll call lights on or off. Here we go. One, two, three, lights on. One, two, three, lights off. One, two, three, lights on. One, two, three, lights off. Okay, now I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and I want you to answer by turning your flashlight on or off. On means yes, off means no. Lights on if you snoozed your alarm this morning. Lights on if you've already had to mow your lawn this year. Lights on if your team is still in March Madness. Lights on if you recently learned that Revelation isn't spelled with an S on the end. Lights on if this is your first Easter at Long Hollow. Okay, here's a more personal question. Lights on if you or someone you know has experienced life change this past year. Lights on if you'd say that this has been a difficult season for you. Lights on if you struggled even to get here today. Lights on if you need some hope. Lights on if someone invited you here today. You can turn your lights off now. Here's the truth of the matter. We have all been invited here today. Every single person, whether you're young or you're old, whether you're rich or you're poor, whether you're healthy or battling sickness, whether you believe or you don't. We've been invited to step into a holy moment. In Revelation 4, John found himself in a holy moment when he said, I looked and there in heaven was an open door. Jesus says in Revelation 3, behold, I stand at the door and knock. This knock is an invitation. An invitation to step into a moment that's been happening long before you and I entered this room. It's a moment to behold. To behold glory, power, victory. To behold resurrection. For our God is not dead, lying buried in a tomb. No, in fact, our God is alive and he is high and lifted up and he sits on the throne of heaven. And we've been invited. You've been invited, just as the angels have been, to see and respond, to join in. This is not a sad moment. This is not a quiet moment. This is a praise moment. Since the dawn of creation, creation itself has never stopped praising its creator. 
Every time the wind blows, making its impression on the trees. Every time the skies change colors in a way that it never has before. Every time a creature does its divinely inspired function. All of creation is pouring out its praise to its creator. Scripture tells us that there is a song in heaven existing from eternity past to eternity future. A simple yet profound song. Three words resound from all the saints and angels of heaven. Three words that echo from heaven to earth here and now. The closer you get, the more you can hear. This is the invitation. The invitation to join with all of heaven, with all creation. So join in.
so good to be able to gather today and celebrate the resurrection of our King Jesus. He is not dead. He is alive. Amen. Come on. He's alive and he is worthy of our worship. And so we gather in this moment to lift up our voice to the name that is above every name, Jesus. So come on, let's lean in together. Let's give him our best. Let's give him our breath. This morning, let's worship together. Your name.
Amen. Have you ever thought about this? The Bible doesn't describe God as love, 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 or even faithful, 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 or even mighty, mighty, mighty. But it does emphasize holy, holy, holy. The holiness of God is the only attribute that is tripled. How about that? And so today, we can say that He is not more holy. He is not more holy, holy, but He is holy, holy, holy. Would you say that with me? Holy, holy, holy. Yes, He is, and He is worthy of our worship and praise. And we're so excited that you're here. You may be seated. Welcome to Long Hollow on this Easter Sunday. We are thrilled to have you here and so excited that you've chosen to join uh, us in worship today. If this is your first time here, please know that we're honored that you chose Long Hollow, whether you're in the room or you're watching online. We're delighted to have you. And if this is your first time, please don't leave without going out these doors and passing our information area and get a gift from us and meet someone there who would love to just get to know you and find out how we might serve your family. And maybe you've been here a while or maybe you're new and you're going, this is a big place it feels like. How do I get connected? Well, you need to hear about Starting Point because Starting Point happens every week and it's our opportunity for you to find out uh, what Long Hollow believes and how to get connected. So if you're interested in that, please take out your phone and text NEXT to 98173 and someone will contact you and get you signed up for that. Well, if you've been at Long Hollow the last several weeks, you've heard that we were looking forward to today to take up our Easter offering. And this offering is is to help us fund some things that we didn't even know about when we uh, budgeted uh, last year and voted on that. And so I want to tell you about three of those initiatives because this is really exciting. The first one is this. We want to take the gospel to prisons across the country. Across the country. And, and not only that, but we want to launch campuses in prisons, Long Hollow campuses, and provide iPads uh, that will access sermons to inmates. So that's part of what this offering will go to. But also beyond that, we want to help support 12 local ministry partners right here in Sumner County who help fight hunger, hunger and take care uh, of basic needs for folks. And then thirdly, we want to help provide scholarships for kids and for students who may not could go to camp uh, without some help. So that's what we're doing when we take up an Easter offering, which is above and beyond our regular tithes and offerings. And together we get to see what God is going to do and how he is going to use that. And so if you're a guest with us today, we certainly do not expect you to give. We're just thankful that you've chosen to worship with us. If you feel compelled, then you're welcome to do that. But Long Hollow Church family, we've been praying about this and we have the opportunity as we continue in worship today to give. And we believe that giving is a part of worship. So if you came prepared to do that today, there are boxes by all the doors when you exit and you can put your offering in there or you can text GIVE to 9873 or you can scan that QR code. So thank you again for your generosity week after week. We thank you for what God is doing through you as we give not to Long Hollow, but through Long Hollow. Would you join me in prayer as we... Uh, Prepare our hearts for what Pastor has to share with us this morning. Father, we cry out with the angels, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. We exalt you in this place today because you alone are worthy, and we thank you for inviting us in to the worship gathering that is already happening. I pray for pastor as he speaks to us today, Lord, would you anoint him by the power of your Holy Spirit? Would you speak to us? And Lord, I pray that we won't leave this place changed because we've encountered the living Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy, happy Easter to you. <clears throat> My voice is held. Let's hope one more. It can hold one more. Uh, happy Easter to you. Uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, insight on what Julie just talked about, uh, just to tell you how God works. God put in my heart last year, what would it be like to plant campuses 
for really the overlooked and looked over people of the world, those in prison. And the only difference between someone in prison and me is the grace of God. So God put this in my heart. We began to put it before you, like, hey, this is not something in our budget, but we believe God's behind it. So last week, Candy and I were in line outside greeting, and a lady came through and she said, hey, I wanna introduce myself. I just moved here, you're never gonna believe it, from California. I said, wow, I wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> I'm, I'm who, who moved here from California? Amen, we're so glad you're here. It took so long, right? But anyway, uh, she said, she said, I still work remotely for all of the educational and uh, all of the material that gets put in all of the prisons in California. And so I connected her with Adam French, our prison planting pastor, and Danny Spano, who you saw baptized this morning. And I just got word that she's gonna help us get into 33 prisons to reach 94,000 inmates with materials and long hollow services. So really, really a cool, neat thing the Lord's doing. By the way, if you notice that there's a lot of people here and uh, thank you for being patient. I wanna welcome those in the chapel, which is full. And now we have people meeting in the student building. Just so you know, if you haven't been at Long Hollow for a while, uh, we're running out of seats. That's a good thing. That's a good problem to have. I tell people the first four years when I got here, I successfully grew the church from 6,500 people to about 4,000. So I was good at that. And then thank God for his grace, gotta turn things around. And so we are in the process, and I'll share this in two weeks. So next week, we have an action-packed April. We have Sunday for Easter. Next week is my testimony. And then the next week is Vision Sunday, where we feel the Lord is leading us the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, part of that vision is a, a worship center with more seats and a children's area that's secure and prayerfully more life groups by the grace of God on campus. Can I get an amen? Uh, an equipping center. So we'll share some of that in a few weeks. Uh, today, you're never gonna believe this, but on Resurrection Sunday, we're in the book of Revelation. Who knew, right? Uh, and some of you are like, really, Robbie? Well, we've been journeying as a church for the last few months, starting in January, studying through the book of Revelation. And today we have the unbelievable privilege, a rare treat, to step through the doorway of heaven and enter a worship, worship service already in progress. Now, I don't know if you caught it, but a lot of the motifs and a lot of the images are of doors. And what we're gonna do is, John's gonna enter into this doorway of heaven. But before I explain this worship service, I want you to think about something. Have you ever pondered for a while, I know I have, what heaven is like? Have you ever thought about that? Like, what is heaven like? Today, like I said, we have the rare treat of going into heaven. Now, before I describe what heaven is, let me tell you a couple things we've learned about the book of Revelation. Number one, contrary to popular opinion, Revelation is not an overwhelming, scary book, right? How many of you were raised by a pastor or a friend saying, don't read that book, it'll make you crazy? Anybody? That's not what Revelation is. The second thing we've learned is that Revelation, this is crazy to think about, Revelation made perfect sense to the first century audience that read it. They understood the symbolism. They knew the motifs. They knew the meaning. We don't because we're 2,000 years removed. And the final insight about Revelation, and this is gonna help us this morning, is that Revelation is a manual of how to look at earthly things from God's perspective. God gives us, in a sense, these, these God goggles, these supernatural lenses that we can see the way God sees. And what we're learning about Revelation is what we see with our eyes is not the full story. There's more to what we can see, right, behind the scenes. And so before I talk about heaven, let me explain a few things about heaven. I wanna teach you what heaven meant to the first century Jew, or the person who was raised in the Hebrew culture. To the Jewish culture, they viewed heaven in three categories. You can write this down if you're taking notes. They viewed heaven in three realms, or three different heavens, if you would, or if you will. Number one is the first heaven. The first heaven for them was what you could see. It's the things we see with our own eyes, the activities we engage in on earth, the, the birds of the sky, if you will, the trees of the forest, the relationships of life. That's the first heaven. The second heaven they called that which is in the solar system, the planets in, in the place, the skies up above, the, the galaxies far away, that was the second heaven. But you ready for this? The third heaven, where we're gonna camp out this morning, the third heaven was simply a place where God was. 
That's where God lived. That's where the angels resided. That's where the powers and principalities of another world, spiritual forces that we can't see with our own eyes, live. Now, I know what you're saying. I don't know if I believe that. Prove it to me. Well, Paul explains it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Remember the story. Paul says, I knew a man at one time who was called in, called up by God to the what? Third heaven. So Paul's talking about a place of heaven where God resides. So let me just rearrange our thinking. And again, this is gonna catch some of you off guard, but just stay with me. When John enters heaven's door, which he will in a moment, John is gonna step from where he is, if he was here, into a doorway which allows him to enter, enter another dimension or the realm of heaven, which is where God is. Don't think of heaven as a place where you're transported far away to hear singing chubby babies on fluffy clouds, right? That's not heaven, folks. That's something that the world taught us. Heaven is a place that is simply the realm of God, the dimension of God. So if you get nothing else, get this. Heaven is not far away, heaven is here. Heaven is close by, it's all around us. In fact, if God were to allow us right now to see into the supernatural realm, I don't wanna scare you, but what would blow you away is the fact that in this room now, in the chapel, in the student center, in your home, you could see angels everywhere, everywhere. Which is why on Sunday morning, one of the prayers we constantly pray with my prayer team is, God, would you send, would you deploy angels set up at the four posts of the property of Long Hollow to protect us from the schemes and distractions of the evil one? By the way, you should probably pray that over your own house. I do that often. Why? Because we don't fight against flesh and blood, right? We're fighting a spiritual battle of another world. Now, before we see John's invitation into heaven, I wanna prepare your heart for what I'm gonna ask you to do in just a few moments. And the reason I wanna do this is, and if you're at the chapel, listen, if you're online, I want you to be prepared so you're not caught off guard. Just like Jesus asked John to join him into the doorway of heaven, I'm gonna ask you in just a few moments to enter the doorway of a relationship with Jesus. And I'm not talking about, hey, I signed a card, walked an aisle, went to camp. Oh, by the way, I was here last Easter. Those things are well and good. What I'm asking you to think about is this. If you've never surrendered your life completely to Jesus Christ, in just a few moments, I'm gonna ask you to declare that by, you ready for this? Standing right where you are in this service, surrounded by all these people. You're crazy, Ravi. You mean, you, mean I'm, you want me to stand in this place? Absolutely, here's why. Because Jesus said, if you can't take a stand on earth for him, and if you're ashamed of him on earth, when he gets to heaven, he'll be ashamed of you before his father and the angels of heaven. Friends, if we can't stand in a place like this, surrounded by people that love and support us, we'll never stand out there, amen? If you have a Bible, turn with me to Revelation 4. Here, here we go. Now, let me just give you a, a forewarning about what's gonna happen this morning. We're going to attempt by the grace of God to study two entire passages of scripture, Revelation 4, Revelation 5, over the next 58 minutes. I'm playing, I'm playing. <laughs> Some of you are like, where'd you invite me, Mom? What kind of guy is this? I'm gonna stand this sir. I know that's you because that was me, because on Easter Sunday, my mom made me go to church, and when my mom said something, we went. Can I get an amen? Amen, amen. Not my boys, they just say, Dad, I, I love going to church. I'll go early. I'll, sh oh, never mind, that's not my kid. But anyway, <laughs> I've heard of kids like that. Now, like, no, these boys love hearing their dad preach, huh? Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Dad, we heard this stuff before. Okay, uh, Revelation chapter four, verse one. If you're there, we like to say word. After this, John said, I looked, and there in heaven... It's an open door, here it is. The first voice that I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and there was a throne. So put your goggles on, look here. There was a throne in heaven and someone was seated on the throne. The one seated there had an appearance of jasper and carnelian stone, a rainbow had the appearance that surrounded it of an emerald that surrounded the throne. 
And around the throne were 24 thrones, write it out, 24 thrones. And on the throne sat 24 elders dressed in white clothes with golden crowns on their heads. Verse seven, the first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like an ox. The third living creature had the face of a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around them and inside. The word of the Lord. I wanna give you two characteristics of this heavenly worship service that I think would apply to our lives today. And take notes, if, if you're writing uh, and taking notes, write this down. Number one is, I wanna describe to you the participants at this service. I wanna show you who shows up to worship the one at the throne. Now, one of the things we're learning about Revelation, and if you've been here, you know this, that numbers, and this is really particularly in Revelation, although the Bible's normally like this, but in Revelation, numbers have a deeper meaning than the literal numeric value they hold. Okay? What that means is the numbers have a symbolic meaning. I would even go on record to say, again, don't email me, you may disagree with me, but I would go on record to say every number in Revelation, first and foremost, is symbolic, never literal. Never literal. Now, I know that's gonna mess some of our flip charts and end times projection, but what about the seven years of tribulation? And what about the thought? Hold on, we'll get to that, right? We'll get to that. But the point is the number 24 is important, why? Because it's the number 12 plus the number 12, which equals 24. Now, we don't know 24, but we know 12, why? In the Old Testament, how many tribes did God call to follow him? How many nations or tribes did he designate? 12, the 12 tribes of Israel. And Jesus, not by chance or happenstance, believe it or not, how many people did Jesus call to be his disciples? You're never gonna believe it. 12, right? You'd almost think God's up to something, right? So 12 tribes of the Old Testament, 12 apostles in the New. In a very simplistic manner for time, let me just say, what I think is happening here is that God shows us the 12 nations which are representative of all the Old Testament saints are gathered together with the 12 apostles, which are representative of all of us, representative of all of us, which are New Testament believers. They are all around the throne worshiping the Lamb. But in addition to that, we notice there are other guests at the worship service, right? Four kind of odd creatures. Uh, you have an ox, you have a lion, you have an eagle, you have a man. Again, simplistically, what I think is happening here is each of these uh, created things are a category of all living things. And the way I learned this was I read a rabbi who said this line, and he said this is the way they looked at the animal kingdom. This rabbi said the mightiest of all the birds in the air was the eagle. The mightiest of all the domestic animals was the ox. The mightiest of all the wild animals was the lion. And the mightiest of all of them was man. And so in a very real sense, what we have here is every person representing, representing every category of humanity is worshiping the king, Jesus, right? And then we break away and all of a sudden we see what they're doing. Look at verse 10. Then we see the 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns down before the throne. And they said, our Lord and our God, you are, say it out loud with me. Now say it like you mean it. You are worthy, that's the word, circle it, worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things and by your will they exist and are created. See, the word worthy is where we get the English word worship. In fact, in the old English, the word worship actually was, by, by um, uh, definition, it was called worth-ship. Worship, why? Because to worship something or someone is simply to ascribe worth to it, to ascribe value to it. So basically, in this case, you're worshiping God because you know how valuable he is. Now, worship for us, we, we think is singing, and that's a part of it, but it's more than that. I mean, singing is a part of it, but a true life of worship is one where everything, don't miss this, everything you do honors God. 
the, the, the videos you watch, the movies you go to, the conversations you entertain, the music you listen to, the friends you have, the relationships you're engaged in, the people you have, all of those things, you look at the totality of your life and you ask the question, am I honoring God with my life and my lips? Think of it this way. I'm making sure everything I do is respectful to God. Now, what I'm about to tell you changed how I viewed worship from here on out. See, because what I used to think, like you probably, is that, that when I came in today, like you, and we started singing as a congregation, that's when worship started, because we started to worship God. But that's not how the Bible describes it. In fact, what the Bible says is, you're gonna love this, we don't begin to worship God, but when we sing praises to God, we enter into an already in progress worship service that's been happening since eternity past that will continue in eternity future and we get to participate in the present moment. How cool is that? When we sing, we join in with all the created beings and the 24 elders and the chorus of praise of the cosmos and the angels and we sing to the one day and night verse 8 says holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and who is and is to come you know that word holy is an interesting word julie asked the question why not mighty why not faithful holy simply means other than, simplistically, but it also means separate from. And so in a real sense, when you say to God, God, you, and this is what the angels say, holy, not once, not twice, holy, 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 you're saying to God, I'm not God, you are. And that needs to be reminded to us, because a lot of times, especially men, we're like, no, we got this, I'm good, I don't need your help. You ever heard somebody say, I'm a self-made man? That's good for you, it's a man without God. But anyway, a self-made woman, right? That's a very prideful, arrogant way. When you say holy, you're not saying that. What you're saying to God is, number one is, I'm not like you, and number two, I desperately need you, desperately. Now ladies, I don't know if you saw this, it's easy to miss, but did you catch who else was singing around the throne? Did y'all see this? It wasn't just the angels, which is really cool. It wasn't even the animals, that, that's neat too, they were. Guess who else was singing around the throne? Men, grown men, who knew? Who knew that a grown man could sing in a worship service? Ladies, can I get an amen, right? But it's like a minor miracle today. Because a lot of you are like I was years ago when I went to church, my dad and I thought we were cool, right? Everybody else is singing. I, I don't, I'm a man, I don't sing. You think you look cool, huh? Just stand there. You look like a goofball. I'm just being honest. I mean, really. When everybody else is singing, it's not cool when you don't sing. Now, here's the reality. The reason you don't sing is the same reason I didn't sing years ago. The reason you sing to God is when you know the value of the person you're worshiping. See, Jesus in your mind is a wallet-sized picture of eternity. And I'm here to tell you, God is so much bigger than that. See, when you stand in the presence of infinite glory, and we all will one day, and we see Jesus for who he is, the only thing you're gonna say is, wow, what can I sing to worship you? See, the problem is many of you don't know who God is. And at least to the second point, this is, you don't know the person of whom we worship. See, when you know the person you worship, you can't help but worship. Chapter five is a hard turn. I wanna prepare you. So John's in this scene with these worshipers and these animals and these elders. Verse five says, then I saw. It's always a transitionary statement in Revelation. Then I saw, now watch this, picture this. In the right hand of the one seated on the throne, a scroll which had writing on both sides, just a sidebar, that's a callback, I think, to a two-sided scroll, to a two-sided tablet, but again, you could figure that out later. So two sides sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy, there it is again, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even look into it. And so I wept and wept, John said. 
So here's the scene, I want you to picture it. The, the, the movie shifts and John now sees a, a scroll in the hand of a man on the throne. And he looks at this scroll and had seven seals on it. Now, we don't understand how this works today, but back then, the only person who could open a scroll that was sealed had to be a person that not only had the might, but the right, okay? They not only had to have the power to open the scroll, but they had to have the authority to open the scroll. Now, we don't really understand this, but we're wondering, like, John, why are you crying? It's a piece of paper, man, come on, it's a papyrus skin. Why are you so worried about what's on the scroll? Why is that a big deal? Because John knows what's on the scroll. Now, I don't wanna claim to, to tell you that, that this is what it, it really, I mean, again, this week, I, I could give you right now probably a whole sermon on no less than 10 observations of what people think, way smarter than me, what's on the scroll. But I will tell you what I believe and am persuaded to believe is on the scroll. And for time, I'll just succinctly say, and you go look this up, based on Isaiah 29 and Daniel 8. That's the two verses, Isaiah 29, Daniel 8. Based on those two verses, here's what I think is on the scroll. This scroll brings a tear to John's eye because he knows the enormity of the moment. This scroll, I'm persuaded to believe, holds the account of God's sovereign plan for all the world. Basically what that means is, this is the plan of God on the scroll of how God one day in the future will bring heaven to earth. How God will judge those who rejected him and turned their back on him. How God will decimate the enemy to the people of God and how one day God will gather all the redeemed, you and me who believed in Jesus around the marriage supper where we can worship him once and for all. Think of it this way. The scroll is eternity past. The scroll contains all the events of the future and it contains the present moment. It also contains the record, look at me, of your life and mine. John knows it doesn't just contain those things because the person who can open the scroll has authority over the scroll, meaning the person who opens the scroll holds the destiny of the world. And he looks around, and he's like, there's no one who can open this. Wow, no one must be in control. Everything must be happening by chance. Now, let me just pull over for a moment. Some of you in here would say, man, that's my life you're describing. Pastor Robbie, my life's out of control. In fact, th there's nothing in my life that's normative. I feel like my life's chaotic. I don't feel like there's joy, there's no peace. I feel like I'm spinning my wheels. Uh, let me just kind of show you what John's gonna show us in a moment. John's gonna beg to differ and say that there's nothing in your life or mine that happens by chance. We serve a sovereign God who's in control of everything, big things and small details. In fact, not to, not to really mess you up, but just wrap your mind around this. God prepared before he created the world for you to be in this service at this time in that seat to hear this sermon. He prepared that. Now I want you to back up and think about this. What had to happen in your life over the past 10 years to get you to this present moment? And it's a reminder, once again, God knows you, right? God sees you. He understands your struggle. He knows about your addiction. He knows about your turmoil. He knows about your difficult. He knows about broken relationships. He knows about the pain. And he knows that the best thing you need is him. Friends, let me encourage you. He wants you to know that there is order in the chaos and that even though your life seems out of control, we know one who controls all things. But in this moment, John doesn't see that, right? So he's looking around, he's like, who's in control? Who's calling the shots? And so it says he wept and he wept. This is an uncontrollable weeping. Why? Because nobody can open the scroll and nobody can look in the scroll. John begins to cry uncontrollably. Look at the text. Look what it says. No one in heaven. Now, it's hard for us in Middle Tennessee to, to even understand this. And even if you're raised in church in a free country like we have to worship, 
It's very hard for us to understand this, but follow me for a moment. Just play along for a moment. I want you to imagine a world without God. Just for a moment. I want you to imagine a world where no one is in control. A world where Things don't work together for the good in the end. A world where there are no happy endings. A world where suffering has no purpose. That death is the end of all things and your life and mine is just meaningless. I want you to imagine for a moment a world where this is all there is. Some of you are like, man, that's a crazy thing to to think about. After reading his biography, I feel like that's what Steve Jobs believed about this life and the afterlife. Uh, This past week, I just finished the biography of Steve Jobs, and for those who know, he was was the founder of of Apple with Steve Wozniak. And uh, the the biography's written by a really uh, popular biographer named Walter Isaacson. And by the way, I'm not recommending this book, so don't say Pastor Robbie said to go get this book. There is some choice words in the book, not a ton, but some. Uh, But the point of the book is this, and I'll summarize the book for you. Here's what I learned from reading this book. It is a masterclass on leadership and not just the leadership you wanna follow because he does a lot of things none of us should emulate, but it's a masterclass of what it's like to rally a group of people to believe that what they're doing in this compelling vision to change the universe is worth sacrificing everything for. He had this ability to convince the people at Apple that what they were doing was gonna alter the course of the universe. And here's the thing, when you read the book, you realize that they were able to excuse his behavior and berating and diminishing their, and disrespecting them and cursing them out repeatedly. And they were able to digest that because the vision to change the world was paramount. When I finished reading that and I got to the end, I sat there and I thought, wow, if this is what a bunch of people gave their life to, to create products that have glass fronts in the form of a rectangular object that fits in our back pocket to make phone calls, what should be said about the church of Jesus Christ? Friends, we have something way better than an iPhone or an iPad. We have the message of hope that at any time for anyone, wherever they are, if they surrender their life to Christ, God can change their life in a moment for eternity. Amen, do you believe that? That, That's way bigger than this. Toward the end of the, the biography, Jobs called in the biographer Isaacson and he said, I wanna talk to you about life after death. If you know anything about Jobs, he was a Buddhist. Uh, He was a new age guy, believed in karma. Um, And here's what he said, I quote. He said, I'm about 50-50. This is right before he's gonna pass from from cancer. He said, I'm about 50-50 on believing in God. For most of my life, I felt there must be more to our existence than meets the eye. Now he admitted that as he faced death, he might be overestimating the odds out of a desire to believe in an afterlife, meaning maybe I'm only believing this because I'm getting close to death. Regardless, here's what he said. I like to think that something survives after you die. It's strange to think that you accumulate all this experience and maybe a little wisdom and it just goes away. So I really want to believe that something survives, that maybe our consciousness endures. He then fell silent for a very long time. And then he said, but on the other hand, perhaps it's like an on and off switch. Click and you're gone. Then he paused again and smiled slightly and said, maybe that's why I never like to put on off switches on Apple devices. Which is kind of funny to think about, but here's what I wanna show you about that. When I compare the emotion of Steve Jobs with the response of the Apostle John, we see two very different things. Steve Jobs is smiling where the Apostle John is weeping uncontrollably when he thinks about the afterlife. Why? Because he understands the magnitude of this moment. John knows that souls hang in the balance. See, John knows because he's experienced and heard Jesus talk about there's a real place called hell. 
and real people go and spend eternity in real pain with real fire and real gnashing of teeth. And he wants no one to go there. So, he, so he's crying uncontrollably. And all of a sudden he's interrupted. An elder taps him on the shoulder and says, hey, calm down. Stop crying. There's nothing to cry for. Why? Look, John, look, take a look. It's the lion. Now watch this. From the tribe of Judah, the root of David who has conquered, why? So that he's now able to open the scroll and the seven seals. And right when John hears this, he starts to think, why did I think of that? That makes perfect sense. You gotta realize, John is a man of the Old Testament. He knows the prophecies about the Messiah. He knows that the Messiah had to come through the lineage of Judah. And by being the lion of Judah, he was the strongest of all the tribe. But in addition to that, he knew the root of David. What that means is he knew the Messiah would come as a king to rule and control and lead the people. And so John's mind is swirling with all these images and these pictures. And he starts to say, wow, that makes sense. A strong, roaring lion that will lead with an iron fist and a king like David who's gonna lead the people with strength and power. He's gonna rip God's enemies apart limb by limb. And John's getting ready to turn around. Follow me here. He's getting ready to turn around and what he's about to see, he is not ready or prepared for. He's not prepared for what he's about to say. Now, let me, just, let me just say before I tell you what I'm about to say. This moment right here, Long Hollow, is the climax of the entire book of Revelation. In fact, eight, nine months ago, when we planned this whole series, I only planned one sermon to follow in one day, and it was this sermon on this day. Why? Because this is the crescendo. And here's why it's important. What John sees in heaven changes how he views everything on earth. He's never the same. So he expects to see this lion. And when he turns around, watch this. It says, then I saw, prepare yourself. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing in the middle of the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders were around, and he had seven horns, seven totality, strength and power, seven eyes, eyes, the picture of wisdom, seven complete. He's all powerful, all knowledgeable, which are the seven spirits sent into the world. And at that moment, he took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. Now, this is an odd image because you're expecting to see the lion of power, but you look and see a lamb that was slaughtered. Now, if you know anything about the New Testament, you know there are two words for lamb. Two different words for lamb. The first word for lamb is of an adult lamb, full grown lamb. And we see the instance of this in John chapter one, when John the Baptist sees Jesus and he says, look, behold, the lamb of God, remember this, who takes away the what? The sin of the world, that's the adult lamb. That's not the word he uses here for lamb. In fact, when John chooses a word to describe what he saw, he uses the second form of lamb, which is, get this, little lamb. In a sense, when John turns around, he doesn't see any lamb, he sees a little lamb. Think of it, he sees Mary's little lamb. And once he sees this, all the chorus of heaven begin to praise him. Look what they do, verse eight. And when they took the scroll, or he took the scroll. The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the lamb. Of course they did. Each one had a harp and a golden bowl filled with incense, don't miss this, which are the prayers of the saints. Let me just stop here. Do you know no prayer ever prayed to God is a waste of your time? Look what the Bible says. God collects every prayer of the saint, you and I, the saints, and they are offered up in his presence as a praise offering to him. And they sang a new song, of course they did. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe, every language, every people, and every nation. Listen, if you were caught off guard just now, when I read that, you missed the point. 
Why is that so thought provoking? Why is that so mind altering? Because you and I, if I say, hey, we're gonna go attack our enemy. Who do you want leading us? Do you want a lion? Or do you want a lamb that came back from the dead and still bloody? The, the choice is always the lion. Nobody chooses a slaughter. And by the way, lambs are dumb. I mean, anybody know that? Let's be honest, right? <laughs> not, not this lamb, obviously, that, that's Jesus. But, but most lambs, right? I mean, I used to have lambs. We, we cared for lambs for a while, uh, and that didn't last long. But what we learned about lambs is they're dumb. They're defenseless. They're helpless. I don't know if you know this, but a lamb can't defend itself. When, when something comes out of lamb, do you know what a lamb does to defend itself, to fight? This is all it does. It stomps and snorts at you. I'm like, get, get out of here. What are you doing? Go away. You know, I mean, it's pretty pathetic. It's worth it. So the question is, why is there a lamb in heaven as the leader of the people of God? Don't miss this. When John sees this and all the elders, they worship because they know what it means. See, God set up a system all the way back in the Garden of Eden, whereby God said, if you guys eat and disrespect me and rebel against me, you will die. And for God to be a just God, something has to, or someone has to die when they sin. And so God set up this system where if an innocent animal is sacrificed in the place of a person, God doesn't judge their sin, he holds it to the innocent animal so that they can live. And so what John's seeing is this, the only way to dismantle death, which by the way, that's what Satan holds over us, death. The only way to dismantle death or to conquer it is to know someone who endured death by the cross, went through the grave and came out on the other side, rising from the dead, which Jesus did on Easter morning. That's why we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, why? Because we know someone who conquered death and came out the other side alive. Friends, that's the only way you're gonna live. The only way we're gonna live is by knowing someone who is alive on the other side. And that's what's so cool about Jesus. We're not worshiping a dead man who's at a tomb in a crematory somewhere at a, at a funeral home. No, we're worshiping a savior who's alive, amen? He's conquered death, hell, and the grave. And if we put our faith in him, we will live too, amen? And listen, not only do you live today, but you live a life of worship. And I don't know if you know this, and I wanna close with this, but God created in the very fabric of your being, he created you to worship him. To understand this, I have to give you a short Hebrew lesson. It's not gonna be long, just stay with me. But the Hebrew language is interesting. In fact, uh, ancient Hebrew does not have any vowels, follow me. It's only consonants. I think there are 20, 22 consonants in Hebrew. The vowels were added later in order to pronounce the language. So it was a written language more than a spoken language. In fact, if you find ancient um, texts, and I have a few in my office, just some ancient papyri and um, uh, the, the articles, you'll see it's all consonants. The formal name of God, and you'll know this, consists of four consonants. Yod, hey, vav, hey. That's the formal name of God. The A and the E are supplied. You know this name in English is what? Yahweh. When you say the name Yahweh, something interesting happens. The consonants used in the name Yahweh are the only consonants, if pronounced correctly, do not allow you to close your lips or touch or use your tongue. Did you know this? You don't have to close your lips. The only consonants in all of Hebrew where you don't close your lips or even use or touch your tongue. Now we know this now because it mimics the very breath of our existence. The only other time we do this is when we breathe and we don't even think about it, but think about this. When you inhale and when you exhale, it's a similar manner. Now I learned this from a rabbi named Rabbi Gershon and he was teaching a bunch of scholars and doctors and professors about this, this thing that we don't even know we're doing, but we do all the time. And he demonstrated it to that group of doctors. And here's what he did. He began to breathe into the mic. Now follow me. You can hear it. 
And as he was doing that, he said this group of prestigious professors and doctors, he could hear in the background, men and women start to audibly weep because they started to understand the significance of this moment. And I don't know if you understand what I'm saying here, but follow me. The first words, if that's the case, you ever spoke when you emerged from your mother's womb was the name of God. And the last breath you're ever gonna take before you leave this world, again, will be the very name of God. And by the way, you don't die on an inhale, you die on an exhale, so you're always gonna complete the name of God. So in a very real sense, think about this. You leave the earth when the name of God no longer fills your lungs. And if that's the case, that may be the reason we die. Why? Because the name of God is no longer in our lips. And so in a very real sense, follow me. If that's the case, and I don't know, but I thought about it this week. If that's the case, God gave life to Adam in the garden when he breathed his name in his nostrils. Now watch this. You just did it. I don't know if you caught that. You're doing it now. You just did it again. Did you catch it? You're breathing. Did you, you didn't even know you were doing it. The very existence of who you are is to praise the name of God with your breath. In fact, I love the fact that God created everyone in his image. It doesn't matter if you're an American or a Russian or from China or South America, you're breathing the very breath or name of God. Whether you're black or white or Asian or Vietnamese or Hispanic, we are breathing the name of God. And this is my favorite. Whether you're a Muslim or a Hindu or an atheist, you are speaking the name of God unaware that you acknowledge the one true God's presence with your breath. Who knew? Is this the reason, now watch this. Is this the reason, this is, this is the one that blows me away, that God finishes the worship book of the Bible, Psalms, the song book of the Bible. Is this the reason God has the last verse, go check it, in Psalms, finishes this way. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, why? Because his praise is on our breath. Here's the question as we close. Since the name of God is in our lungs, is the praise of God on your lips. Are you, are you worshiping God? Are you living a life of worship? Now, I know when you hear a service like this, you're thinking, wow, I wanna be there. That's what I would think. Man, I hope I'm at the throne. I hope I'm around the angels and the elders and, and the four living creatures, I wanna be there. Now, here's the bad news. You can't buy a ticket to this worship service in heaven, okay, just bad news. You can't be good enough to secure a spot there. You can't earn your way there. You can't be smart enough, can't even go to church long enough, can't give enough to get there. The only way to secure a spot at that service is to be one who surrender their life completely to Jesus and is repentant of their sins and trusted him as the sacrifice as their savior. And I know in a room this size, you're saying, man, I don't know if that's me. And I don't know if that's true about you, but you do. As I mentioned earlier, the cool thing about this breath illustration is that if there's breath in your lungs, there's hope for your life. And I believe if you're alive, no matter how bad it is right now, the best days of your life are ahead. Friends, here's what the slaughtered lamb teaches us. And I'll just camp here one moment because it's the last service and not many people heard this from the others, but I'll tell you this. Knowing the slaughtered lamb is the motif of God, which it is. That has changed my entire perspective of the book of Revelation, by the way. Because I thought the book of Revelation was a book of this mean, overbearing, domineering, dictatorship God who's gonna go out and destroy his enemy. And it's gonna be a bloodbath against them and, and the wrath of God's coming down. But the problem is that's not the motif of the picture we see. We don't see God wielding a sword. We see God giving his life as a lamb. In fact, even in the New Testament, when Jesus was with the apostles, Peter's trying to kill the soldiers. And Jesus like, put the sword away, bro. That's not how this thing goes. We don't win by conquering. We win when I die for your sin. So here's the picture. Power in the Christian life, I want you to hear this, does not come from strength, but through submission. Submission to the lamb. See, life transformation happened for me 
not by acting like I had it all together, because I did that well for years. It's by admitting that I didn't have it all together. I'm talking to somebody, look at me. It's saying that it's okay to not be okay. Next week, you're gonna hear my story if you come back, and I haven't told it in years, and I'm gonna try to write it fresh for the first time in 21 years as the Lord would lead me, but I, I'm gonna share a story of a man who had a 200 plus dollar a day heroin and cocaine addiction as a result of a car accident. Today's terms is probably $400 a day my addiction would be. I stole $15,000 from my parents 20 something, 24 years ago, probably 30,000, 40,000 today. Bankrupted the family. My parents kicked me out of my house. I lived without gas, electricity, and water for three different months. Uh, I lived homeless for a while. I went to my parents, went to rehab, not once, but twice. And I actually relapsed twice. Why? Because you're gonna see a story of highs and lows, get ahead and fall back. And the reason I'm gonna tell that story is this. I'm gonna show you that it wasn't until I admitted that I could not fix myself that God began to fix me. And some of you are lying to yourself. And so here's the thing, it's time to stop lying to yourself and lying to your friends and lying to your family and get honest before God today and confess your sin and say, God, I need help today, today. So I wanna pray for you because I really believe in this moment, God can do more in this moment. If you're here in the chapel, in the student center, listen to me, or even online, I believe God can do more in a moment than any man or woman can manufacture in a lifetime. And it's time for you to be broken over your sin before the one who was broken for your sin. So would you bow your head for just a moment? We don't have a ton of time, but I just wanna pray over you right now. And I'm gonna ask that the same power of God that was given to me years ago when I surrendered my life to Jesus would be bestowed upon you now. And I'm gonna ask the Lord to do something so amazing in your life that even if he told you, you would not believe. And I told you earlier, not to catch you off guard, I was gonna ask you to stand. And what you're standing is you're just declaring you're not ashamed to take a stand for Jesus. Let me remind you, if you can't stand in this place surrounded by loved ones and friends, you will never stand when you leave this place. So here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm not gonna draw it out, but if that's you, if you're saying, Pastor Robbie, I'm ready to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. Not, not if you're ready to walk the aisle or signed a card in the past or went to VBS or church last year, no. Are you ready to surrender your life to Jesus who's worthy of your worship? I'm gonna ask you, just stand right where you are. No one looking around. Just pop right up and stand. If the Holy Spirit is, ta thank you, brother. If the Holy Spirit taps you on the shoulder, I want you just to stand. Others are already standing that made it easy for you. Just stand right where you are. Praise God. Thank you, brother. Anyone else? Praise God. People standing all over. A lot of prayers have gone into this day. A lot of people praying right now for you. Would you just stand? Don't, don't think about what others are gonna think. Don't worry, believe me, when you stand before Jesus, you're not gonna care about anyone else, I promise you. He's worthy to be worshiped and he's longed for you to worship him. Praise God, people standing all over, praise God. Just a moment longer. Listen, if you're thinking, man, I wish I would stand, but I'm worried about what people would think. And if I get home, I would regret not standing. If that's you, mom, would you just stand right now? Just stand right where you are. Thank you, praise God. Anyone else? Dad, would you just stand right where you are? Student, you've been playing games with God. You know and God knows that you're not following him and today's the day. Today's the day. Just pop right up. Praise God, thank you for standing. If you're looking at me, praise God. Praise God, people still standing, praise God. Hey, if you're standing, no one else but those standing, just look at me for a moment and I wanna speak a, a word into your life and I'm gonna pray for you. This is a big deal. And I'm not taking this lightly because not long ago, I was in a service just like that, like this, in a seat just like yours with a preacher on stage, that wasn't me. And he asked me to do something similar. I know this is a big deal. I know it's overwhelming, but this is what I know about the Bible. Anytime someone saw the miraculous, they had to step out of their comfort zone. Literally, people crawled on their hands and knees just to touch the hem of the garment. People cried out and they told them to be quiet and they said, no, I'm gonna cry out even more. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So this is a big deal for you. And so here's what I wanna do. I wanna solidify the moment by praying over you and praying with you, okay? We got two songs we're gonna play. I promise you'll be able to go back. I'm gonna ask you to join me right here in the front and I'm gonna kneel with you and I'm gonna pray alongside of you, over you. And we're just gonna ask the Lord, the same power the Lord put in my life 21 years ago, 
would come upon you all. So brother, would you come? If you're standing, I promise you, they'll let you out, believe me. Uh, they're gonna be happy to stand up and let you out. So if you're in the middle of the row, you come. If you're in the balcony, we're gonna wait for you, I promise. So just make your way down. If you're standing, brother, just grab the hand of your mom or dad or spouse and just say, hey, would you go with me? <clears throat> don't miss this moment. Please don't miss this moment. There's something about taking a step forward in faith. God honors that. God's pleased with that. The Bible said the angels of heaven worship one sinner turns around and we have a few more than one. So there's a party in heaven of celebration right now. So you come, we're gonna wait for you. You I know, mean, I see people come respond like this. You know what it reminds me of? I just can't help but think of my own life. My mom and dad raised in the Catholic church said, it's kind of funny, they said, for all those years you were lost, we lit a candle every Sunday and prayed for you. And they said, we almost burned the church down, but, but we prayed. And listen, when I see people, come, look at the people coming. When I see people coming, here's what it reminds me of. It reminds me of the hundreds and thousands of prayers that people prayed for you, just like me. I'm here because of the prayers of people praying for me, kids and moms and dads and brothers and sisters who never gave up. So this is a big deal for you. I mean, people are still coming, praise God. If you're in the balcony and you need to come, maybe now you're saying, man, I missed it, I wanna come. You come, just come right now. Just say, man, I wanna surrender my life to Jesus. You don't tell me anything, just come. Praise God, whole families are coming. what I want you to do. If you're up here, just, just bow down for just a moment with me and I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes. And if you're coming, you could just kind of make your way alongside of us. I'm gonna ask you to take a deep breath in. Just exhale out slowly. And ask the Lord to put on your heart what it is in your life that is holding you back from being fully and completely surrendered to Him. Just say, God, what is it in my life? And when he puts that on your heart, whether it's a porn addiction or whether it's anger or resentment or, 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 or animosity toward another person or a gossiping tongue or uh, an addiction in your life or alcoholism or drugs or whatever it is, just lift that up to him and confess that to him and, and then ask Jesus to enter into your life, to have a personal relationship with you and ask the Lord to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Father, I don't know the background and the circumstances of every person here, but I know we all have the same thing in common. We are desperately in need of your saving grace, not just for tomorrow and eternity, but for the present moment today. God, we need strength and power today to live, to be the men and women the boys and girls you've called us to be. And so, God, I pray today that you would meet us here. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Have free reign of this place, Lord. This is yours, not mine. And we're praying, God, that they would leave today and go home and even their family would say, I don't know what, where is Jenny at? Why? Because I see Jesus in you. That we wouldn't even look the same, God. We would have a lightness to our step and people would say, what happened? And they would say, I met Jesus today and he changed my life. I love you, Lord. We ask it in the only name we know how. That's the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, before you go back, just look at me for just a moment. I'm gonna just speak something of encouragement. The, the one lie Satan whispered in my ears, which is why I relapsed twice, is you can do it yourself. I promise you, he'll tell you, you don't need the church, you don't need any help. That's a lie from the pit of hell. I, to help me early on as a Christian, I wrote a book that I wish I had as a new Christian to help me walk the Christian life. Like how to pray, how to engage in spiritual warfare, who am I in Christ, why I can't lose my salvation and why that's important. I wanna give that to everybody. We have copies for all of you. I want you just to have that before you leave and we wanna pray and encourage you in that. So it's gonna be quick. We have two songs, believe me, you'll make your, your way back. So just stand with me for a moment. We have our Next Steps area here. You're just gonna go through. You're gonna say, hey, here, here's 
I stood for uh, the invitation. We're gonna give you a copy of this resource. You're gonna be able to take it home and we're gonna celebrate what God's doing. So would you just kind of make your way, John, Pastor John, raise your hand, Pastor Danny. Yeah, let's praise the Lord for those. Would you just make your way over here? Yeah, to our left and yeah, let's praise the Lord. Let's stand, we're gonna stand and let's thank God for what he's doing, amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord uh, this morning and just make your way. I promise you can go back to your seat. We'll have a lot of time. We're gonna, we're gonna worship together. Uh, yeah, just kind of make your way over. And uh, we're gonna give you this resource. Uh, as you're walking, I wanna speak to the church. This is the entire message. Don't miss what I'm about to say. Whenever we come to church every week, listen, the question we should never ask is, what did I get out of worship? That is not a biblical question. That's a me-centered, selfish question. The question we need to ask at a service is, did I enter into the already in progress worship service that's going on in heaven? Am I singing along today with the 24 angels and the four living creatures and the chorus of praise of the cosmos and all of the angels in heaven, worshiping the one who is worthy to be worth? The question is, am I engaging in a service that started in eternity past, that will go in eternity future, and we can participate in the present? And what I'm about to say is gonna change worship for you. When we worship through song, watch this we actually bridge the gap between heaven and earth. Why? Because if we have loved ones, and I know we all do, if we have friends, if we have family members who have gone on before us to heaven, they're right now singing praises to Jesus. My best friend that I lost years ago, he's praising Jesus. The loved one you lost, she's praising Jesus. And when we sing, we get to join arms and participate together, amen? And we're praising the one who's worthy to be worshiped, King Jesus. So let's sing today, amen? Let's praise Jesus. He's worthy to be worshiped today. Come on, church, we sing this together in your name. It's your name is the highest, your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones all thrones in dominions all powers in positions your name stands above them all your name your name is the highest your name i 
Do I got time for one more? No, I'm joking. No, I'm joking. Uh, man, the Lord is good. Amen. Man, it's so encouraging to see all the people that responded uh, to the gospel. Can we just thank the Lord for that um, even now? Hey, uh, the service is kind of coming to an end, but man, we believe that God is still working. And so man, if the Lord is still working in your heart and you would love to talk to someone, maybe about following the Lord, we'd love to meet you in the next steps area. I know we got people in the chapel and some in the student building. And so we'd love to meet with you um, and, and walk you through those next steps. Hey, I want to invite you back next weekend for a really special weekend, a powerful weekend. Take a look at this video real quick. It's a real quick video. Uh, take a look at this. When I look at this picture, I just see I see someone who's hopeless, who has nowhere to turn to. I'm sorry. He had a wonderful future and just, it was all gone. Yeah, I want to I want to invite you back to a powerful weekend next weekend as we get to hear Pastor Robbie's uh, testimony. Many of you know his story, and many of you know someone that needs to hear his story. Maybe it's a neighbor, a friend, a family member, or whoever. We want to invite them to come and hear this story of how God can change someone's life. And so we're adding a 6 p.m. service um, next weekend. We're really fired up about that. So invite. Uh, someone to come. It's going to be a really powerful weekend. Come on. Can we thank the Lord for all that he's done, man? So grateful, man. Well, we love you guys. Hope you have an amazing Easter. We'll see you guys next weekend.